Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And we're, today we're delighted to be joined by a really popular and highly respected professor of political science at the University of Minnesota, uh, Tanisha Fazal. Uh, the professor is uh, from Long Island, grew up there, attended Harvard as an undergrad, has a doctorate from Stanford. Um, she's had a wonderful academic career teaching at Columbia, Notre Dame, and now she's been at the University of Minnesota for about five years. Um, she's the author of two award-winning books, the first one called State Death, The Politics and Geography of Conquest, Occupation, and Annexation was published in 2007. And then the, the other book, Wars of Law, Unintended Consequence in the Regulation of Armed Conflict, was published in 2018. She's one of the lead authors in a uh, this current edition of Foreign Affairs, which is one of the most uh, respected publications in the world for foreign policy, and has written an important essay called The Return of Conquest, which pertains to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and just looking at the kind of the historical and, and kind of geopolitical consequences of that invasion. Um, she's also done some really important work in the field of global diplomacy, uh, connecting that to COVID and other past pandemics, and so has some really important insights there, and joins us today from Minnesota. So, Professor, great to see you again. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, tell me, in one of your essays, you were writing about growing up, and you talk about as a 12-year-old talking international politics with your dad. I mean, it was it was not quite crafted that way, but it was about politics, but then it, it be kind of expanded into to international relations. Talk about those conversations as a 12 year old with your dad. Oh, wow. Um, it was a long time ago now, obviously. Um, and, you know, my dad was an immigrant. He was um, from Bangladesh. And so he was kind of naturally interested in international relations and thinking about he had a, an interesting perspective, I think, um, on how international politics worked because he wasn't thinking about it necessarily from the perspective of the U.S. That wasn't his default. He was thinking about it more from the perspective of somebody from a country that had been colonized, you know, first by the British and then Bangladesh had been part of um, Pakistan. And so, you know, kind of double colonization and was a pretty unstable country having had its share of political violence. And he really cared deeply about um, humanitarian issues in particular. He was a medical doctor also. Um, and th those were, you know, so we would engage with those kinds of questions about, you know, what was right. It was a, a lot of it was not just why things were happening, but whether they should be happening. And your mom was from Puerto Rico, as I understand it. And I mean, how did they meet? Was this one of these graduate uh, school relationships or medical school or? No, I think it was a setup. Oh. Um, and um, they, it was, you know, my mom is a very hospitable, welcoming person. She's a wonderful host. And she, uh, upon learning that my father was at the, you know, at the time uh, it was Bangladesh was part of Pakistan. She went, you know, knowing that she was going to meet him, she, she went to the library and got out a cookbook on Indian food and made him apple curry, which sounds really gross. Um, and, and I don't think he liked it either, either, but somehow they got married uh, <laughs> from there. And then you went to, to Harvard as an undergrad and, and you've, you've written about uh, two mentors that were particularly important. You, uh, Luis Richardson and Lisa Martin. Talk about how they shaped your, your academic career. I'd be happy to. So Louise Richardson, we should say, is so she was. They were both professors at Harvard at the time. Um, and Dr. Richardson is has been a real trailblazer. She uh, is currently effectively the president of Oxford. She's the first female president of Oxford, and and she's the incoming um, president of the Carnegie Corporation as well. And again, it's going to be the first woman leading that institution. Uh, so. Um, she is, she was someone who I was a research assistant for when I was, I think I want to say a sophomore in college. Uh, and I had the opportunity to see the kind of work she was doing and to realize that, oh, this is actually really interesting and very engaging. But also she was somebody who, 
she was a woman, she had a family, she had a really rich life. And I looked at her and thought, oh, this is what I want to do. This is, you know, just in for all of it, not just the substance professionally of the work, but the life that she has is a, is a kind of lifestyle that was really attractive to me. And then Lisa Martin was my senior thesis advisor when I was, um, when I was a, a senior in college. Uh, and she, I think, really was a, an, just a terrific guide intellectually. And I had no idea at the time how, what a prominent political scientist she was. I was pretty clueless, I have to say. Um, but I still remember the conversations that we would have together and how formative those were for me intellectually. Well, you've written about uh, your, your early academic years. You say, to my advisors, somewhat sometimes chagrin, I kept being attracted to big unanswered questions like, why don't states die anymore? Over time, I've realized that as questions about macro historical change, I tend to find most appealing. On a daily basis, international relations is dynamic, but major change is rare, often occurs slowly and slowly. Investigating the cause and consequences of those inflection points and longer term trends was what most intrigued me. Grand international relations theory has never been my passion. Talk about that if you would. So if you've ever taken, or for you or anyone else who's ever taken a class in international relations, then you know that international relations is full of what I call ismism. Um, you know, there's realism and constructivism and liberalism and these big theories of international relations. And they do help us. They provide a lens for thinking about international politics. But they are pretty static theories. They don't really help explain change. They inspire a lot of debate. And I don't really, that's not really what attracts me to the field of international relations. I'm more interested in questions like, you know, a, a, one of the questions that I look at in my, in my second book on international humanitarian law is, why don't states issue formal declarations of war anymore? Uh, and the book right now is looking at some of the consequences of changes in military medicine over a pretty long period of time. So I really am interested in thinking about the kind of the trajectory of international relations um, that it requires a lot of deep historical research, but it doesn't really lend itself to the kinds of isms um, that dominate a lot of international relations theory. And you've said that one of the critical points of your approach to scholarship is to lead with and focus on questions rather than answers, the importance of, of asking questions. And I'm wondering, I mean, just without getting too abstract here, like the notion of hypotheses. So when, when you ask questions, do you tend to have kind of a, a theory of the case, but you're willing to be surprised and change your view? Or how does that work for you? That's a that's actually a really important question that you're asking, um, and this, and it feeds into advice that I generally give my my graduate students and even undergraduates who are conducting research. Because, uh, and I'm going to back into an answer. Um, when I was in graduate school, I I was sort of playing around with different dissertation ideas, and um, there was one idea I had that was more hypothesis driven. It was argument driven, and. I was wrong. It turned out it, the evidence didn't support this particular idea. And I realized that I was much more interested in the answer than I was in the question. Um, and so I think, you know, from it's sort of my natural inclination, despite that one case, to be attracted to questions, to start with questions rather than answers. But I always tell students that strategically, I think it makes more sense to start with questions and think about possible answers but you always have to be open to the possibility that you're wrong. And that's why you also have to think about more than one possible answer and figure out, you know, let the evidence adjudicate which one is most supported. Well, let's talk for a sec about your two books and just in the context of, of questions and, and your book on state death. What question drove that, that book? What questions were you trying to confront? So the, there were a lot of questions. Um, there are some really basic questions like what is state death? Um, but the, I think the main question was really a, a why question, which is why is it that some states die, especially die violently while others don't? And when I meet, when I talk about state death, because this is a term that could be interpreted in lots of different ways. So I think it's important to be clear. What I mean is the formal loss of control over foreign policy to another state. So typically state death happens when one state 
takes over and absorbs another state entirely. There's a, there's a cartographic change. So this country no longer exists anymore on the map. It's now become part of another country. But of course, there are cases of state death where a state breaks apart at the seams. The Soviet Union um, is, is a case like that. Um, and then there are other cases of state death where two states voluntarily join together um, and one or both lose their identity in the formation of this new state. But most state deaths are violent. Most state deaths historically have been cases of one state taking over and you know, fully annexing and absorbing another. And I was trying to figure out why, um, you know, going back to your question about grand theories of international relations, one of those theories, realism, suggests that um, states act as if they were rational, and if they didn't, they would be selected out of the system, so they would die, essentially. But no one had really, and that's a real linchpin of realist international relations theory, but no one had actually tested that claim. And so this was sort of a one of, the, one of my aims in writing this book. And in one of your writings, I mean, you point out like the example of Poland, which, for example, you know, was literally no longer a existing country for a century or so. And it's it's famously been just, you know, devoured by Russia and uh, Germany and others. I mean, that's that's sort of an example of a state that has died and then also has been resurrected. Yes. I mean, in the late 18th, you know, Poland, in the, if you really go back in time, was a pretty strong country. Um, but when you get to the late 18th century, there's a period of decades where Poland is um, slowly eaten alive, if you will, by Russia, Austria, and Prussia. And there's actually on the cover of, of the, my state death book, there's a, a kind of a political cartoon of the leaders of those three countries pulling apart the map um, of Poland. And then, of course, it gets resurrected after World War II, excuse me, after World War I, but then divided between Germany and Russia again um, during World War II and then resurrected again. So Poland is kind of in a, a challenging neighborhood, which is part of why it keeps has kept suffering state death. In terms of, of questions, you, your book, Wars of Law, um, I know you became very intrigued with the notion of, of the declaration of war, um, triggering a whole set of, of a whole body of really international law that is supposed to govern how nations fight war and, and so forth. Talk about the, the questions you're trying to answer in uh, Wars of Law. So there, so one of the questions that I ask in the book is why is it that states no longer issue formal declarations of war in their wars with each other in interstate wars? But another trend that I noticed was that there was also a decline in the use of peace treaties to end interstate wars, wars between states. But of course, most wars today, you know, notwithstanding what's happening right now in uh, in Ukraine, have been civil wars. And so, I also wanted to think about, um, you know, in the context of civil wars, what are we seeing, for example, when it comes to the incidents and raid and any trends in peace treaties? So there was the again these sort of empirical just trends to get a handle on to begin with, but then wanting to figure out, okay, what's driving these trends? And what I found was that international humanitarian law. So, you know, the, the set of laws that I think we identify most clearly with international humanitarian law are the 1949 Geneva Convention. So the laws of war that govern belligerent conduct during conflict was um, itself changing over time because it was increasing in number. So they, we have many more of these laws on the books today than we used to in the past, but also changing in character. The first laws of war were really about, they kind of protected belligerent rights. And today the laws of war are much more about protecting civilians. Um, and so this creates a lot of obligations for states engaged in interstate war. And one way to limit those, the legal liability um, for those obligations is to avoid explicitly being in a state of war. And so that's why I, I argue that states no longer declare war or are less likely to conclude formal peace treaties in their wars with each other. But in civil wars, it's kind of a, a different situation because a lot of the belligerents in civil wars are, um, when you're ta not talking about the state, the, the internationally recognized government, but the, the opposition, um, especially if they're groups that want their own independent state, they actually try very hard to convey an impression, at least, that they are compliant with the laws of war. And so they're much more likely to engage these formalities of war. 
Well, let's talk about your foreign affairs essay, which I think was really important. And I want to read a couple sentences and then just have you go to town. You write, um, what makes Russia's invasion so shocking was its anachronistic nature. For decades, this kind of territorial conquest has seemed to be a thing of the past. It had been more than 30 years since one country had to try to conquer another internet to another internationally recognized country outright when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. This restraint formed the basis of the international system. Border wars were, by and large, sacrosanct. And you write about the norm of state sovereignty. So maybe uh, to start out, first of all, how did this essay come about? I mean, you know, you, you, you know, as a scholar, being a, a lead essay in foreign affairs is about as good as it gets. How did this come about? And then I guess more to the substance of, uh, of your, your argument. Well, I think I was trying to think about um, what made this war different, um, not necessarily unique, but different, especially in the context of international law and norms. And it's not, you know, at the if you'll remember at the start of the war, there was a lot of discussion about the refugee flows from Ukraine into Europe. But there have been lots of refugee flows into Europe as well as other countries. So it's not refugees that make the war different. And I remember talking also to um, a younger French reporter at the start of the war, and she, <clears throat> this, this very thoughtful uh, uh, reporter was saying that her generation really hadn't experienced war. And I was saying, well, no, that's not true either, because there's been plenty of war. It's just your generation in Western Europe maybe hasn't uh, experienced war, but you know there are plenty of Syrians and Yemenis who are your generation who have experienced war. So to me, what made the war, and and you know, before I kind of go on, let me say that I think that one thing that does make the war different is that Ukrainians are white, right? Um, but from the perspective of my own scholarship, what made the war really different was that this post-1945 bedrock principle of international order the norm against territorial conquest is being blatantly challenged. And it's, I think, both interesting and important to think about Russia's stance vis-a-vis -vis international law in this particular conflict. And you can just compare it to Crimea in 2014, where there were the so-called little green men. So Russia wasn't as obvious or as blatant in terms of it in, it in its attack on Crimea in 2014 as it has been in its attack on Ukraine in 2022. And the reason that I say that this is um, a bedrock principle of international order is that this is a, a norm uh, that was created because war was believed to be about territory. And so the idea was that you would remove territory as a legitimate cause of war. This doesn't mean that war went away, but I do think that this norm has shaped um, war since 1945 when it was really codified in the UN Charter. I want to read another couple sentences and have you um, expand. You say, now with Russia's invasion, the norm against territorial conquest has been tested in the most threatening in vivid way since the end of World War II. The war in Ukraine is reminiscent of a previous more violent era. If the global community allows Russia to subsume U Ukraine, states may more frequently use force to challenge borders and wars may break out, former empires may be reinstated, <coughs> pardon me, and more countries may be brought to the edge of extinction. So let's talk about just, uh, you know, obviously the, the plight of Ukraine is profoundly important, but also the, the broader issue of what is stake for this, uh, at stake for this global system if Russia's um, aggression is in some way rewarded. Well, I think one way that I think about the norm against territorial conquest and therefore the importance of any precedent that this particular violation uh, sets is that this norm, it's kind of a club good, right? As long as you're part of the club of internationally recognized states, then your existence is supposed to be secured and your borders should be mostly safe from attack. And so any international order, international system that doesn't have this norm is probably going to be quite violent and unstable. But I think we should also, you know, we have to acknowledge that the norm is not all good. Um, it is in some ways quite a permissive norm. It allows, it, it prohibits 
this one class of sovereignty violations, taking over violently another state wholesale and saying, this is now my state, or this state is now part of my territory. But it allows things like foreign imposed regime changes, right? Interventions to re replace regimes and leaders. Um, and it also is a norm, and this is, I think, really interesting and important when thinking about possible precedents, especially when it comes to China, it's a norm that depends on international recognition. And so there are, you know, a lot of responses I've gotten to this piece have been, you know, the what about kind of responses, talking about really important cases, but many of which are cases that uh, of countries that did not have that or do not have that kind of international recognition. And so they were already more vulnerable, even if we, you know, even if the norm is robust. But I, but in, you know, looking ahead, I think, you know, one of my concerns is that um, if this norm is to, is one that erodes, and I do think it leaves the international system vulnerable to lots of instability. And the other point I would just make on, on this is that we know, and we're seeing this right now in Ukraine, that wars of territorial conquest um, are especially brutal for local civilian populations because the countries that are engaged in territorial conquest uh, oftentimes engage in civilian targeting to quell or to depopulate the areas that they're trying to absorb. Uh, one important point you make in this article is that the historic context from, I think you say, 1816 to 1945, you know, this this norm was not particularly a vibrant one, but it's been largely this post-World War II era in which the United States has played a central role in enforcing and respecting this norm. And that obviously was, you know, was clear during the invasion of Kuwait when, you know, Bush, President Bush 41 said this will not stand. Talk about the United States' important role up to now in defending this norm. Um, well, so I think it's interesting, again, to think about the history here. So, you know, we saw U.S. presidents like Woodrow Wilson and FDR, you know, who definitely, there are lots of things they did that I don't support. You know, Wilson, for example, was famously racist. Um, but I think that part of the reason that the U.S., that we should acknowledge that, that the U.S. supported this norm and was such a big proponent of the norm after World War II was partly because the U.S. was done with its own territorial conquests, right? Um, and so it was kind of a little bit easier to say, let's, you know, let's just impose this rule um, and this will help us maintain stability in the international system. And, and as you note, the U.S. has been, you know, a continued supporter of the norm against territorial conquest, but has done so from a position of great strength, especially compared to other countries. And I think today we're potentially in a different situation. Well, of course, everyone has been asking for months now, you know, how does this end? And I know you're not in the prediction business, but as you look at the most probable outcomes, I mean, the one that people speculate about is that Russia at a certain point taking, you know, fairly, at least parts of southern Ukraine and eastern Ukraine, and then finding a way to to pull back. Um, if, if that were to obtain, how seriously would the norm be undermined? I think it depends on what the reaction of the rest of the world is. So if if the rest of the world were to accept that, then I do think that that is you know, to, in other words, to recognize Russian claims over these territories, um, then I do think that that would be quite damaging to the norm. Um, if the rest of the world were not to accept it, then it's less damaging. But we should point out that there's been, there's a lot of variation in this rest of the world category <laughs> that I'm talking about. Um, you know, I really think it's the West that has been most, um, that has that has issued the strongest response to Russia in this regard, but I'm, you know, troubled by the fact that we've seen a less robust response from the global South, um, for example, where you know when you look at the abstentions and even some no votes uh, around U.S. U. U. Excuse me, United Nations re resolutions. There's a 
a lot less solidarity than you might have expected. And so that gives me pause about the viability of the norm going forward. About a year or so ago, we had a, one of these conversations with Margaret McMillan in the context of a book that she had just written called War. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I want to read a couple sentences and maybe connected to sort of your interest in this, in this realm of study. She said, I hope to persuade you of one thing. War is not an aberration best forgotten as quickly as possible, nor is it simply an absence of peace, which is really the normal state of affairs. If we fail to grasp how deeply intertwined war and human society are, to the point that we cannot say where one predominates or causes the other, we are missing an important dimension of the human story. We cannot ignore war and its impact on the development of human society if we hope to understand our world and how we reach this point in history. War is a mystery and a terrifying one. That is why we meet, must keep trying to understand it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about just your interest in this topic as an academic discipline. Um, okay, so let me just first say that I fully agree with the claim that war is, you know, unfortunately an enduring feature. You know, there, as you probably know, there's been um, a debate in recent years um, or a suggestion, a claim, and made that war has been on the decline. Uh, and I've engaged in that debate saying that I don't think that war is, I think that that claim is at best overstated. And in fact, I have another article in Foreign Affairs with Paul Post from University of Chicago that's called War is Not Over, where we're saying that, you know, to say that war is over is, is missing a lot of what's going on. But in terms of why I study war, which is, I think, why you're at part of what you're asking, um, it's partly because it is so frequent, and my motivation is usually about trying to mitigate war's worst effects. So, you know, I'm enough of a cynic to think that we're probably not going to be able to get rid of war, but also enough of an optimist to hope that we can maybe. Um, help some of the people who are uh, who suffer as a result of war. And I think that some of your scholarship has focused on the issue of just medical care during times of war and just, you know, how we've kind of reversed what, you know, for many years, uh, you know, in war, you know, if people were injured, they died by and large. Now, you know, people are injured and they oftentimes survive, oftentimes with you know, very, very ser serious illnesses, which have, you know, obviously devastate lives, but also have a long term effect on the economic um, uh, economics of a country. Yeah, so this is actually um, the, the sort of speaks to two points. Um, one, it actually speaks this point about medical care speaks to the, the decline of war thesis, because that claim that war is on the decline is really based on um, looking at battle fatalities. But given improvements in medical care and conflict zones, what we've seen is a real shifting of battle casualties from the fatal to the non-fatal column. So that's one reason I'm skeptical of the claim that war is on the decline. But when we attach this to some of the longer term effects um, of medical care and conflict zones, and I think we have, it really brings us to some important political decisions. So to just, just to put the, the um, to put some numbers to the changes or the effects of the changes in medical care, historically, the ratio of wounded to killed in battle is three to one. So for every person who's a battle fatality, you would have three people wounded. Um, for the U.S. today, depending on who you talk to, the wounded to killed ratio is somewhere between 10 to 1 and 17 to 1. This is a really, that's a big change. And so what that means is that as a percentage of those deployed, we have many more people coming home today having survived injuries that they would not have survived in the past. Uh, and so they themselves are bearing the human costs of war. Their, their families are bearing the human costs of war. And because there's also been an expansion in um, veterans benefits over time in the US, the government is financially bearing the, the cost of war. But here's the thing, when um, 
we think about the cost of war, we tend to think about the human cost of war in terms of fatalities and the financial cost of war in terms of material. How much does it cost to get a fighter jet in the air? And I think that that is really problematic because insofar as we think about the decision to go to war as a cost benefit calculation, we are getting the cost wrong if we're not thinking about the longer tail of the cost of war that has really increased as a result of these improvements in medical care and also the expansion of the veterans benefit system. And of course, I'm not saying that we should roll back the medical care or even the veterans benefits, but that if we're going to think about going to war as a cost benefit calculation, then we have to at least have this side of the calculation right. I just, this is not a central point, but I, I read someplace, I was just reading about the federal spending and and I was really surprised at, at how large the Department of Veterans Affairs is. I mean, it is now one of the, the most uh, expensive federal agencies we have. Well, this is one of the few issues where there's by relative bipartisan consensus and what is a very polarized system. Right. Well, let's talk about health diplomacy. You've written a really provocative and interesting article on, on health diplomacy. So let's start out by just defining the term and then also uh, talking about how you became interested in uh, or what questions you're trying to answer. I presume that COVID had something to do with at least intensifying your interest on this, but, but talk about that. Um, okay, well, so <clears throat> when I'm talking about health diplomacy, what I mean is health aid that is, um, you know, sometimes delivered uh, with the intention of alleviating um, or with, with a humanitarian intention, but sometimes delivered with a more political or a strategic intention, sometimes both. Um, so it's pretty simple definition, but actually departs from what has been the standard definition, which has really tended to focus mostly on the humanitarian part, partly because I think that's what I think people who uh, had studied this topic in the past hoped health aid would do. But I think that if we want to get there, then we need to recognize the more political or strategic dimensions of health aid as well. Um, and so in terms of my own interest in health aid, this was actually something that was spur, uh, spurred or emerged from the work I've been doing in military medicine, uh, because I would be talking to these military doctors and, you know, about the project that I was just mentioning to you. And I'll, oftentimes at the end, you know, you ask, is there anything else we should talk about or you want that you want to talk about as you're winding down? And a few of them mentioned to me how they would be deployed in a particular country, and they would notice that the Chinese had a medical team there uh, and engaged in military medical diplomacy, essentially, um, but that the, the U.S. did not. Uh, and they were feeling like, you know, we're a little bit behind on this. And so I had started thinking about health diplomacy from this sort of competitive military medical perspective. And then with the onset of COVID, I started to, as you say, think of it more broadly, um, you know, once we got into things like mask diplomacy and vaccine diplomacy, and, and also just thinking about health diplomacy as a new forum for great power competition, which I think is something that we're seeing very clearly today. Right. Um, as you say, I mean, the motives for health diplomacy can be, you know, humanitarian and also strategic. And then the means can be, you know, regional, bilateral, global, um, of course, we hope during a pandemic there is a robust global response, but I think if there's some consensus is that the, the global response has not been particularly robust and effective. And so talk about that broadly. And also one of the points you make in your essay, which I think is really important, is that you know the WHO, the World Health Organization, has got hammered by lots of folks. And you make the point that a lot of times it's being blamed for things that it was never really set out to do. Yeah, I mean, I think that those two points about global health diplomacy and the WHO really connect nicely to each other. The WHO is a United Nations agency. It's an international governmental organization. Its members are states. Um, and while it has, you know, it rests on um, a series of agreements like the 2005 International Health Regulations, under which, or according to which, states are supposed to report any health outbreaks to the WHO. They're not supposed to impose travel restrictions if there's any kind of, um, of an outbreak or a pandemic. The WHO doesn't have the power to enforce 
uh, any of these regulations. And the reason it doesn't have the power to do this is because states don't want it to, right? Um, they don't want to give up that kind of sovereignty to the WHO. That's pretty intrusive from the perspective of a state to have you know, this, this uh, international governmental agency being able to get very granular data about any kinds of um, disease outbreaks in your country. And so while it is, I think, natural on the one hand for the world to turn to the WHO, it is the World Health Organization in the face of a pandemic, I also think that our expectations of the WHO were unrealistic. It just was never set up to respond effectively to a pandemic like the COVID-19 pandemic because we haven't given, states haven't given it the power um, to respond effectively. And so it has been sort of a scientific clearinghouse. Uh, and I think it's been uh, effective, at least to some extent in that regard, but uh, has definitely not been able to live up to some other expectations uh, real, you know, that, that states and also people have had of it. Well, we're still obviously working our way through COVID, but from the perspective you have now, I mean, how is the regional response? How has the bilateral response been? I mean, what does the ledger look like to you from from your perspective about the, res the response, the sort of health di diplomatic response to COVID? Well, I think we're definitely seeing a lot in the way of bilateral and kind of multilateral strategic health diplomacy. And one way that we're, you know, we saw this, especially at the beginning um, with mask diplomacy, especially by the Chinese who were really trying to rehabilitate their image to some extent. And we are also seeing it with respect to vaccine diplomacy. And this is actually an area that I think is quite concerning because China was definitely and is still engaged in a fair amount of vaccine diplomacy. But you know, from what I understand, and I want to be clear that I'm a my doctorate is in political science. I'm not, you know, I don't have a medical degree of any kind. But from what I understand, <clears throat> the Chinese vaccines are not very effective. And so, but early in the pandemic, or not early in the pandemic, but early in the vaccine diplomacy rollout, they were all that was on offer because um, countries that were developing the mRNA vaccines and even to some extent AstraZeneca were hoarding them for their own populations. Uh, and so you have these very highly vaccinated countries in say Latin America, um, but that still have had really bad outbreaks. And I think it's partly because of the vaccines that they were taking, right? The, the, up, the uptake was high, but the vaccine was the Chinese vaccine. Uh, and now we're seeing uh, the Quad, right? The US, Japan, India, Australia, uh, engaged in their own kind of vaccine diplomacy, um, which is delivering, I think, higher quality vaccines, but not necessarily to the countries that need it the most. Uh, they're doing it in a way to really counter China's influence, especially in Asia, or to try and counter China's influence. So I think what we're seeing with respect to bilateral health diplomacy is really mostly strategic and not being conducted in a way that's necessarily going to get us to a faster end to the pandemic. Regional health diplomacy, I think, has more promise, at least in theory. Um, and you know, one example that I would point to here is um, regional health diplomacy in Africa, where um, you know the Africa CDC has actually done a pretty good job uh, with respect to the pandemic, and African countries have have worked through the African CDC and have stood up. Uh, mechanisms um, for facilities like AVAT, which is the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Trust. And again, this is, you know, last year in 2021, and, and this is a lot has changed since then. But I thought it was really interesting at the time that through AVAT, they were negotiating for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, and they, they had a lot more bargaining power through AVAT than they did through COVAX, which is the WHO's vaccine facility. So with COVAX, it was sort of, you know, you get what you get and you don't get upset. Um, but with AVAT, it, you know, they, they were able to say, no, we really want the J&J &J vaccine because, um, you know, it's one shot because it doesn't require cold storage. Uh, and they, they were able to leverage their bargaining power uh, as a group of countries 
to negotiate better prices, for example. So I think that that whole that approach holds more promise for getting people what they want and really responding to local conditions. But even bilateral health diplomacy, at least from the US, is well, certainly global health diplomacy, I would say from the US, let me back that up a little bit, um, is um, like not in the best condition right now. Congress isn't funding it. Uh, and this is just going to make the pandemic last longer. Right. I mean, I guess it'll take some time before all the documents come out. But do, is it your sense that both, say, the U.S. and China have been kind of overtly competitive in their response to COVID? I mean, to the point of kind of keeping an eye on the other as opposed to being singularly focused on helping the world get through this horrible episode? I think it's a mix. Um, but I, you know, if if we... If the goal was to get the world out of the pandemic, then I think we would have seen a very different kind of vaccine rollout than what we saw. You know, uh, I would not have been vaccinated as quickly as I as I was. My kids might still not be vaccinated. I mean, they are now because they can be. Um, instead, you would have seen the world follow the advice of Dr. Tedros, who called for health workers around the world to be vaccinated before you know, ordinary citizens. Uh, and that's not at all what we saw. Uh, I do think, so in some other research that I'm conducting on US and Chinese health diplomacy that looks at pre-COVID times, so like up to 2000, 17, um, what I and my co-author on this paper, Logan Stundel, are finding is that U.S. and Chinese health diplomacy really track each other. Um, so if the U.S. is somewhere, then China ends up going there and, and vice versa. And so I, with that precedent in mind, I think that we are probably seeing a fair amount of co competition in uh, vaccine diplomacy as well. Well, you've written also in terms of health diplomacy that there are two very different perspectives, at least two. One is a public health perspective, which is different and asks different questions than a political science. Talk about that, if you would. Uh, so this is a little bit what I meant when I talked about the definition of health diplomacy, because most of the people who have studied health diplomacy are at global health centers and they do, they are the people who have those medical degrees, right? As opposed to someone like me, they are um, physical scientists and they look at um, public health and global health as a scientific problem. Uh, and it makes sense to have this approach. And there is a scientific consensus, not on everything, but on a lot of things as to, you know, here's what the solution is. If you have a pandemic, here's the solution in terms of the vaccine rollout. But then they pretty quickly run into the brick wall of politics. Um, and sort of my read of the sociology of that field is, is a little bit similar to climatologists, right? You know, 20 years ago, where they know what the they know what the problem is, they know what the solution is, and then they, again, run into the brick wall of politics when it comes to addressing climate change and don't really have a way of getting through that wall. And in some ways, um, don't want to, like politics is this, you know, it's Sully is the, the enterprise that they're engaged in. So they kind of are banging their head against that brick wall, as opposed to trying to figure out what are the bricks made of? Uh, what's the mortar? I mean, not to torture this metaphor too much. Um, and, you know, how how can you negotiate through or tear down that brick wall? And that is where I think political scientists can be helpful, although political scientists haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about health diplomacy. So I don't want it at all to seem like I'm blaming the people who work in the health diplomacy field, um, at least no more so than I'm blaming myself or, or my colleagues in political science because we haven't paid attention to this issue. In, in your essay, you write, however, as pandemic, pandemics become more frequent, localized health diplomacy is less likely to be effective given the importance of global mitigation and containment. I guess two pieces. I mean, we've heard, you know, no one really knows for sure, of course, but do you think it's very likely that we are entering an era where there will be more pandemics that we're going to have to deal with and that we are going to need a far more robust global capacity? Um, so I think that, yes, we probably, and again, this is my read of the science that other people have produced in fields that are not mine, but um, 
But my read of that literature is that, yes, we will, and that that actually is connected to urbanization and globalization and to some extent climate change as well. So, you know, my understanding from from the experts in that field is that there is going to be an acceleration of pandemics. Um, And then your other question is about the global response. And so ideally you do have a stronger, more robust global response. I don't know that that is what's going to happen though. um, You know, I don't, there, you know, there's been, um, you know, recently there was, there's been a call for a pandemic treaty. There was a recent summit on this um, issue, or these, you know, around these issues, but it's not clear to me that it's really going to go anywhere. We had a question emailed in from Clint in Belleville, who, who cited one, your, I think your foreign affairs articles in which you say, among other things, states would be wise to carefully tend to their borders. I mean, that's just a small excerpt from it. And he just wonders, how do we do this without acquiring the negatives associated with nationalism? Um, there are, I think, lots of ways to tend to borders. Um, you know, there are border control methods. You can, you know, you have patrols, you can have uh, border maintenance methods, but, you know, the basic idea is that there's visibility around the border, Um, but it's also in some ways tending to your borders, like I'm talking about it in a really literal sense, but I think we have to step back and can think about it a little bit more, I don't know, metaphorically, if you will, um, which is to say that states have to understand what threats they might be facing. Um, and figure out what are the most efficient and effective ways to address those threats. Um, I'm not sure that, uh, I mean, I, I understand very much the, the sentiment of the question. Um, you know, I don't know how you, <clears throat> excuse me, how you um, prevent a resurgence of nationalism. I think we're already seeing we're already seeing that to some extent with the sort of global populism uh, in countries like Hungary, uh, you know, in Brazil, in the U.S. Uh, to an extent, there's already a lot of attention paid to borders as a result of that. So that, you know, that horse may have left the barn, unfortunately. Well, in terms of your 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 future work, what are I know you've mentioned several of the areas that you're interested in. Is there a, a, new, a new book in the works or a, like a, a major project that is that is unfolding now? Yeah, so the book I'm writing right now is one that I was talking about a little bit earlier, and it's called Military Medicine and the Hidden Costs of War, uh, and it's on um, precisely how improvements in military medicine, as well as the expansion of the veterans benefit system have increased the long-term downstream costs of war that we tend not to appreciate. So I'm kind of deep in the weeds. Um, I just attended a few weeks ago, the Special Operations Medical Association meeting, which was fascinating um, to attend as as a relative outsider. And, um, you know, I, I spend my days reading official medical histories of the world wars right now. Well, I, I, I read a, or saw a, maybe an interview you did a reference between the kind of the connection between the academic world and the policy world. And you said that, you know, your, your own inclination is the academic, but that you actually really do enjoy interacting with people in the policy world. And, and you think that that kind of c- contact and fertilization is really important. Talk about that, if you would. Um, <clears throat> I think that the... We have to, as academics, we have to think about why we do the work that we do. Um, and partly it might be to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. I think teaching is an, an enormously important part of what we do uh, as well. But I also think that we have an obligation, you know, especially those of us who study topics like war, to translate what is oftentimes very jargony. Uh, research for a wider audience, uh, including for the policy world, uh, right? Because otherwise it's, you know, it stays within this circle and it doesn't benefit the public good and there's no debate about it. And you sort of, you, you have, you might just have the kind of same old ideas being talked about and the new research doesn't really end up 
affecting policy. I think a lot of people, and this is something that I've seen, this is a change that I've observed over the course of my career, that I think that there is an increasing commitment, uh, at least on the part of political scientists and, and international relations scholars, certainly to engage more with the policy world. Uh, and I think that that is, that is to the good. Well, tell us about your teaching at the University of Minnesota. I mean, what, are, what classes do you teach? Uh, I, I saw a clip of a class and you're obviously an amazing teacher. So tell us about, uh, uh, about what you, you teach and, and just your, your connection with students. Um, so I teach at the both the undergraduate and the graduate level. Um, at the undergraduate level, I teach our standard international introduction to international relations class, but a class that I taught um, summer of 2020, and then I taught again spring of 2021, it was actually the international relations of COVID-19. Um, and so that was obviously stood up fairly quickly uh, and taught both times on Zoom because of the subject of the class. Uh, and that was really um, a fascinating class to teach. And one of the essential pillar of that class was uh, a course long simulation. So for example, uh, last year in spring 21, when I taught it, um, you know, we had delegates or delegations from the US, from China, from Taiwan, but also from Pfizer uh, and from the Gates Foundation. And they were trying to negotiate the, or renegotiate the international health regulations and also trying to figure out um, uh, to, to strike deals around vaccine distribution. And I think that that was, um, I mean, it was a lot of work, <laughs> that, that simulation, uh, and my teaching assistant was you know, amazing in that class as well. Uh, the, um, it was, I think, a really good experience for the students because it forced them to think about this issue, not from the perspective of what, what they thought should happen, but it really made them think about the interests of the specific group they were representing and understanding why what was happening was happening. And another assignment that I had for that class that I quite liked was um, the students had to pick a good that was affected by the pandemic and trace the supply chain um, of that good. Uh, and that was, they did just a really terrific job. There was one, uh, you know, a couple, a couple students got together and they made a podcast about, uh, flour, right? Cause if you, you know, everybody had their sourdough starter, <laughs> there was a lot of baking during the pandemic, uh, especially the, the beginning part of the pandemic, cause we're still in it, as you noted. Uh, and so they were talking about the, the artisanal flour mill down the street, but also the, you know, how you couldn't get big bags of flour at Costco, uh, anymore. So that that class was was a lot of fun to teach. And then I, I teach graduate classes again on sort of basic theories of international relations, but also on international institutions and norms. And I saw a clip of a class, I think this was maybe when you were at Notre Dame, a class you were teaching on civil wars and just... Yes. So I've also taught classes at, at both at Notre Dame and at... Um, and at Minnesota on, on contemporary civil wars. Um, which is, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, most wars today, notwithstanding what's going on in Ukraine, have been civil wars. And so in that class, we really focus on um, just figuring out first what is a civil war and what isn't a civil war. Um, and then talking about the, the causes of civil war, how they are conducted, and then how they are concluded. Um, in specific cases uh, and also trends over time, just because that's something that I'm always interested in. Great. Well, let me ask you just finally, in terms of how you like to relax, I saw in one interview or one clip, you are joking to your students about liking yoga. I mean, what, how, how do you, I mean, you're obviously involved in some pretty intense work. How do you, how do you sort of uh, uh, pull back from that and relax? Um, well, so I do, I go for a lot of walks um, and uh, I also do do yoga. I haven't been back to the gym um, since, since the pandemic started, but, but the other thing that I, another hobby I sort of had, but really accelerated during the pandemic was Legos. Um, so actually this is a, a Lego typewriter um, right here. Uh, and I don't know if you can see this, but this is the, the Capitol building. Um, which uh, we put this together right after January 6th. 
Um, and then this is a, a Lego bonsai tree uh, over here. So that's something else I've been doing. But then I also, I love to read. Um, and I try, um, you know, I, I especially love, you know, fantasy novels and also historical fiction. Well, it's funny because we had this interview with Margaret McMillan. I asked her the same question and she, she said she, she likes to read murder mysteries. And she says a, a surprising number of academics like murder mysteries. And she was sort of trying to, to speculate on why that might be the case. She thought perhaps long faculty meetings might have had something to do with that. Well, I think they also have answers. So we've definitely over the course of the pandemic, we've my husband and I have been um, watching a lot of British murder mystery shows. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. Well, Nisha, thank you so much for just a delightful conversation. It's been really uh, interesting and informative. Uh, I would urge everyone to go out and get a copy of Foreign Affairs and, and read uh, the essay, which is really important, and to follow the professor's work on health diplomacy which will be really important. And uh, when circumstances allow and you're traveling through Illinois, we'd like to divert you to, to Southern Illinois and show you the university and maybe speak with some students and talk to people in the region about some of the important work that you're doing. That'd be great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series. We will have a, a clip of this. We'll have the, the whole interview on YouTube uh, tomorrow. So please look at it, show it to family and friends. And thank you for supporting the Institute and keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.